Welcome to part three of four, looking at chapter 11. Um, this chapter we're really focusing on nucleic acids, so we um, talked about um, the kind of the history behind the discovery of nucleic acids. Part two, we looked at nucleic acid structure, specifically looking at DNA, but we also um, kind of reviewed RNA a little bit. Um, this section, we're gonna be focusing on DNA replication. So this is kind of going over what I just mentioned. So the first part was introduction to our genetic material, which we discovered was DNA, um, molecular structure of DNA and RNA in part two, and this part, um, the DNA replication part. So DNA replication is really important because we have to be able to pass this genetic material on to um, other cells or to the next generation. Um, so this is really, really important in continuing on um, generations. So in um, the 1950s we learned about how the um, structure of DNA was discovered by Watson and Crick along with uh, lots of other help from other scientists. So later on in the 1950s um, we wanted to figure out how DNA actually replicated itself. And there are three different models that were proposed. So there's, um, there's a semi-conservative model, the conservative model, and the dispersive model. So these are looking at these three different models up here. So up at the top we have our semi-conservative model for DNA replication. So in this semi-conservative model, you start off with an original double helix, which is on the left-hand side, and it's shaded red. So that represents the original strand. In semi-conservative, it states that those two original strands, they separate from each other, and then the complementary side is going to be newly synthesized, and that will be shown in the blue strand. So semi-conservative states that your new DNA is going to be half of the old or half of the parental, and the other strand in our double helix is going to be newly synthesized, and that's called the daughter strand. So that was one model that was proposed. And these models are kind of like hypotheses, um, so they had to have some idea of what they were looking for before they could come up with an experiment and figure out which model worked. Our second model that they thought of was called the conservative model, which is shown in the middle. So this is where we have our original strand in red, again. In the conservative mechanism, it states that our original strand is conserved, so our original strands make up one copy of the DNA, and then the other copy of the DNA is all newly synthesized, which is shown in the blue on the bottom. So conservative means to conserve what you originally have. So we have one strand that's totally the old or the parental, one strand that's newly synthesized in this model. The third model is going to be the dispersive mechanism. So again, we have our original double helix in the red on the left-hand side. That double helix, um, it's going to be broken up into pieces, and those pieces are going to be put together with newly synthesized pieces. So we get strands that are part blue, part red, um, and it's all mixed up together, or dispersed together to make your two new DNA strands. So you can see we have these three different mechanisms or models of DNA replication. So they did an experiment, and you can read about it in the book, and they discovered that the model that was followed during DNA replication is the semi-conservative one, the first one that we looked at. So just a reminder, this is when during replication our two parental strands that were in red, they're going to separate from each other, and they're going to serve as template strands to form the new side, which was represented as the blue side. And the new nucleotides that are created on the blue side, they're going to obey Chargoff's rules, or those complementary base pairing rules, which was the adenine pairs of thymine on the other side, and guanine pairs of cytosine on the other side. So we're still going to follow those base pairing rules. And these rules it allows us to create two new double helices that are going to be half old, so half red, half new, so they're half blue on the other side. And these two double helices are going to be um, identical to the original or the parental strand, and they're also identical to each other. 
so here is a representation of that DNA replication process that we've been talking about. So here, um, up at the top, we have our original parental strand shown in red, and you can see that our cytosines go with the guanines across from each other, adenines go with thymines across each other, and so on. So you have those complementary base pairing rules. So what happens is that a red strand, those two red strands, they separate from each other at something called a replication fork, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit. But at that replication fork, you have a lot going on, and what happens is that you have your new side being synthesized in the blue based off the template strand that's in the red. And this happens on both of your red strands. So you end up with two DNA double helices that are going to be identical to each other. And again, they're going to have that semi-conservative replication, so they're half old, so that's the red part, half new, which is in the blue part over here. And then remember that these two strands are going to be identical to each other and identical to our original starting strand. So we're making copies of our DNA in this process. So where this DNA process um, starts, you're going to have something called an origin of replication. And this origin of replication, it's going to um, show you where you're going to separate your two parental strands from each other and it's going to cause this opening called a replication bubble. And at that replication bubble, you're going to have two forks on either side of your replication bubble. And I'll show you this in a minute. Um, bacteria, because they have a circular chromosome, just one chromosome, they have a single origin of replication where DNA replication is going to start. Eukaryotic cells, because um, their chromosomes are linear, they have a start and an end to them, and we can have multiple chromosomes eukaryotic cells are going to have multiple origins of replication and that allows the DNA replication to go faster because you're starting at multiple points on each of your chromosomes. So you want this DNA replication to be fast but also efficient and accurate. So here is um, the origin of replication in a prokaryotic organism, specifically a bacteria chromosome. So up at the top we have our red circular DNA chromosome and then the little yellow oval, that's our origin of replication. So at that origin of replication you split apart your two red strands and this is going to form two replication forks that are going to go in opposite directions of each other. Those replication forks, that's where you're going to synthesize the new blue strand that's complementary to the red template strand. And those replication forks, they just travel away from each other in opposite directions until they meet up on the other side of your chromosome. So you're going to have a site where your replication ends, where the two replication forks meet, and this is shown at the bottom of the image. And you can see that we're going to end up with two um, strands of circular DNA, one on the left-hand side and one on the right-hand side. And again, it's semi-conservative, so one of those strands is red, from the parental strand, one of them will be blue that was newly synthesized. Here is an example of um, chromosome replication in a eukaryotic cell. So here we're going to have multiple origins of replication, so there's five shown on this chromosome up at the top. So we have our red DNA strand up at the top, we have five origins of replication. So at each of those origins of replication, we get the um, DNA strands separating from each other. We get two replication forks going in opposite directions. Those replication forks travel until they meet um, the other replication fork from the other origin that's right next to it. So again, these multiple origins of replication allow these chromosomes to replicate faster than if you just had one starting point and it had to travel all the way down the chromosome. Um, and then at the end, we end up with our two strands of DNA that are half red, half blue. These two strands in eukaryotic chromosomes are held together at a centromere in the middle. So you can see that we have this X-shaped chromosome that we're very quite familiar with as, as a chromosome. So here is a um, summary of these two different um, things that we just went over looking at. Prokaryotic cells on the left, where you have one origin of replication, 
compared to eukaryotic cells on the right-hand side where you can have multiple origins of replication. Um, so again, this is just kind of a summary slide of what we just went over. So I mentioned these replication forks. So each origin of replication forms that replication bubble where we have our two DNA strands separating from each other. And then within that replication bubble, you have two replication forks on each side of the bubble. So we're just going to focus on one of those replication forks. At this replication fork, we have three really important types of proteins that are going to be found that help to form our replication fork. So right ahead of a replication fork, we have an enzyme. And remember, enzymes are a type of protein. So we have an enzyme called DNA topoisomerase. And this is the one at the top. DNA topoisomerase, this is going to be ahead of your replication fork. And it's actually relieving something called supercoiling. So it's relieving any of that coiling in your double helix so that we kind of straighten out the DNA a little bit in order to allow the other proteins to come in and help with this replication fork. Our second protein, this is the big one, is the DNA helicase. DNA helicase, it binds to your DNA right at the replication fork. It travels from 5 to 3, so it's on um, one side of your DNA strand. And as it travels, it uses up ATP, which remember is energy, so we're using up energy in order to break the hydrogen bonds between our two DNA strands. And we're breaking those hydrogen bonds, so we separate those two DNA strands from each other. And that allows those DNA strands to be open in order to be used as a template to form um, your other new blue synthesized side. And as the DNA helicase moves forward, it causes the, the two strands to separate it, and it opens up your replication fork. So those two DNA strands that we just separated with our DNA helicase, they are complementary to each other. So they really, really want to reform all those hydrogen bonds to hold um, and put that DNA back together. So in order to keep our two strands separated from each other, we have proteins called single strand binding proteins. So these proteins, they attach on to our two parental strands that we just separated from each other. And they, um, the proteins keep those two strands open so that we can use those two strands as templates to create our newly synthesized side. So here are those three different proteins that we just talked about on our DNA strand. So here, our DNA strand, we're still representing it as the parental strand, so it's in the red. And we have our DNA topoisomerase, which relieves all that supercoiling. The DNA helicase is traveling on the DNA going from the 5 prime to the 3 prime. So remember, DNA helicase, it's separating your two strands from each other. It's breaking all those hydrogen bonds between um, those nitrogen bases. And then the little orange proteins that kind of look like shrimp, um, those are single-stranded binding proteins. They help to keep the two strands separate from each other. So here we have the setup for our replication fork. So we have our two strands separated from each other. So the next part is that we have to synthesize the complementary side, which is going to be that blue side, that newly synthesized side on both of our template strands. The enzyme that does this newly synthesized side is called DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase is an enzyme that um, is going to use energy to link all of our nucleotides together. And these nucleotides are not just going to randomly be linked together, we're going to use our complementary base pairing rules. So if your template strand has an adenine, the new nucleotide coming in on the other side is going to be a thymine. And DNA polymerase can recognize what's on the template strand, and it can put in the correct nucleotide. And then as those correct nucleotides are coming in, those nucleotides are going to be bonded together um, to create that new side. So these new nucleotides that are coming into the DNA polymerase, um, they look a little bit different than the nucleotides we find in the DNA. So these free nucleotides, they have three phosphate groups attached to them instead of just the one. 
So these three phosphate groups, um, if you think of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, it's basically a nucleotide that has three phosphates attached to it. So besides ATP, you can also have um, GTP, CTP, or TTP. So you can have like cytosine triphosphate, which is um, the one in the bottom left-hand corner that's coming in to create our new blue side over here. So because these nucleotides have three phosphates, they're holding energy, and our DNA polymerase is going to use that energy in order to attach that new incoming nucleotide to the already existing side right here. So DNA polymerase is the enzyme that is going to synthesize that new side that is being represented as the blue side. DNA polymerase has other features to it as well, and these two features actually cause a few little problems that we have to deal with. Um, so one of the features is that DNA polymerase is unable to just begin synthesizing a DNA strand on a bare template strand. So what happens is we have to put on something called a primer. So we have another enzyme called DNA primase that's going to put on a short RNA primer. And that was going to signal to the DNA polymerase where it should start synthesizing the new DNA strand. So I'm going to show you a little bit more about that. The other problem that um, DNA polymerase has is that it only works going in the 5 to 3 direction. So it only travels one direction, which is going to be a problem because if you remember, DNA is anti-parallel, so the strands go opposite directions. So one strand we're going to synthesize very easily, the second strand is going to be a little bit more work. So here's how we deal with um, DNA polymerase unable to just attach to a template strand. So we have that DNA primer that's going to put on an RNA primer that's represented in um, yellow on this image up here. So um, we have our primase comes in, puts on a little RNA primer. That primer is then a signal to DNA polymerase where it should attach on. The DNA polymerase can attach onto the primer and then it can start to synthesize the nucleotides and put them together. Um, and again, DNA polymerase can only go in one direction, so it can only go starting at the five direction, going towards the three prime direction. So because of this directionality of our DNA primase, our two template strands, one of them is called the leading strand. This is where DNA can be synthesized in one long continuous molecule. And this is because our um, replication fork is going one direction, our um, DNA polymerase will go in that same direction. So it's just a continuous molecule. So your DNA primase makes one RNA primer. The DNA polymerase attaches to that primer, and then it can just start traveling around down the strand attaching nucleotides. Okay. So the leading strand, this is the good strand. Um, DNA replication goes very, very quickly on the strand. The other template strand is called the lagging strand, and this is because it's um, in the wrong direction. So DNA can only synthesize going 5 to 3, um, and what happens is that the DNA polymerase is going to synthesize that DNA in a really short fragments called Okazagi fragments. So here we're going to be using all that information to really look at this DNA replication process. So. Um, to simplify these images, we're really going to just focus on synthesizing the DNA and the proteins involved in opening or creating the replication fork are not shown on this image, but they're still there. They're just not shown here to simplify the process. So if we look at the top image, we have our red DNA. It's already been separated from each other by the, um, hel the helicase. So the first thing that happens is we have our DNA primase that's going to come in and put on those RNA primers. And the RNA is shown in the yellow. On our top strand, that's going to be our leading strand, the DNA primase puts on a little primer at the right-hand side. 
on the bottom strand, the legging strand, our DNA primer has to put the primer on to the left hand where the replication fork is starting. And that again is because our polymerase molecule can only put nucleotides on going five to three. So our top strand, everything's gonna be moving towards the left hand side along with our replication fork. On the bottom strand, the legging strand, things are gonna be moving off towards the right. So they're gonna be going in the wrong direction of the direction everything else is going. So again, that bottom strand is going to be our problem strand, just because of the directionality and how the enzymes work. So if we look at our second picture, on our leading strand up at the top, we had our RNA primer put on. Our DNA polymerase attaches the primer, and then it can just travel along to the left, putting on those new blue DNA nucleotides. And the replication fork is also moving off towards the left. So our top strand, everything's going left, which is good. Um, it can be made, or the DNA can be made in one continuous motion. The bottom strand, our RNA primer was put on. DNA primer attaches on, and it has to go to the right, which is in the opposite direction of what everything else is going. So this causes these little fragments to be created called the Okazagi fragments. So our first primer is now in the middle um, on the bottom strand. Our, RNA, our DNA polymerase attaches on and goes to the right. Our second primer is put on at the opening of the replication fork and that allows the DNA polymerase to attach on and travel to the right to make another little fragment. So here at the top, now our leading strand at the top continues to go on because it's everything's moving to the left. The bottom strand, we get a third primer put on, another polymerase will attach on and create another fragment. These um, RNA primers, they are need to be replaced by DNA. In order to do that, another type of polymerase called DNA polymerase 1 comes in and it cuts out that RNA and replaces it with DNA because we want everything to be DNA to put it in the blue. And that also occurs on the leading strand up at the top later on. So our yellow RNA is cut out, it's replaced by the blue DNA. The other thing that happens is we have to attach those Okazagi fragments together and that's done by an enzyme called DNA ligase. So that creates our um, Okazagi fragments to be continuous with each other because we're going to link them all together. So we have to replace our RNA and we have to attach our Okazagi fragments together on the legging strand. So you can see that the leading strand is pretty easy to deal with. The legging strand on the bottom is a little more complicated. We have to fix a few of those issues in order to get a continuous piece of DNA. But eventually everything works out. We end up with two identical DNA strands that are going to be half parental or half old, half red. And the other side is going to be new. It's going to be um, the blue side in this example. So here are the proteins involved in this DNA replication process. So there are six different proteins that you need to know, and you need to know the function of them. So this is table 11.2. So the first three proteins listed up here, those are involved in creating our replication fork. So our DNA helicase, that's the enzyme that's going to separate your DNA strands into two single strands. The single strand and binding proteins keep those single strands um, from coming back together to reform the double helix. And then the topoisomerase, it's going to remove that supercoiling that is ahead of the replication fork. So just is going to relieve some of that extra um, coiling that happens in the helices of your DNA. And then once we have a replication fork set up, then we have our next three enzymes that are going to help with the actual DNA replication process. So our DNA primase is going to put on sh those short RNA primers. The DNA polymerase is going to attach onto those primers. It's going to synthesize the DNA in both the leading and legging strand. Another type of polymerase is going to remove those RNA primers and replace it with DNA. 
So DNA polymerase is all about making DNA and synthesizing DNA. On our legging strand, we're going to have DNA ligase come in to attach our Okazagi fragments together to make that legging strand continuous with this. So this is a really good review table that you can use to kind of understand um, the enzymes that are involved and what they actually do in this replication process. So this replication process is very accurate due to three big reasons. So the first one is that the hydrogen bonding between adenine and thymine and the hydrogen bonding between guanine and cytosine is more stable than if you created some sort of mismatch, like if you tried to put um, a cytosine across from an adenine. So these nucleotides are, um, they fit together like puzzle pieces with each other, so that helps to create this replication process to be more accurate. The second reason why DNA replication is very accurate is that the DNA polymerase is an enzyme, so it has an active site, and if you remember from chapter 6, enzymes are very specific to what they do. Um, so DNA polymerase is very, very unlikely to form these mismatched pairs to begin with. And then the third reason is that some DNA polymerases, they can actually reverse back and remove the mismatched pair if it does occur, but it's very rare if it occurs. So we have proofreading that can occur. We have enzymes that are constantly proofreading the DNA, backing up, taking out missing pairs, putting in the correct pair. And then there's also a lot of other DNA repair enzymes as well. And replicating DNA accurately is important because we don't want mutations to show up because mutations in general turn out to be bad, although there are a few mutations that do end up being good. Um, but in order to reproduce, you want to produce offspring that look just like you, so you want the DNA to be very accurate 